Good afternoon to everyone. It's so nice to uh, be able to uh, speak to you today. Uh, today I want to talk to you about our God. Our God is an optimistic God. Our God has a positive outlook and a positive disposition. God believes in the ultimate potential and goodness of man. In spite of all the hard-headedness of humanity, God still has the positive outlook and the optimism for mankind. God's optimism is unbounded. It's without limit. It's unimaginable that his optimism for humanity. The optimism stems from his, from his great love of mankind and in the belief that ultimately goodness will prevail. God believes in the goodness of his creation. With all optimism, God believes that many will choose to do the right thing and the godly thing. That man will eventually align with the righteousness of God. When God looks at mankind, with all our faults, with all our misdeeds, with all our hard-headedness, God didn't see disappointments. He didn't see failures. Rather, God sees potential. God has this positive disposition, optimism yeah, for his creation. When Adam sinned, God did not scratch his plan for mankind. God knows that there is hope. God knows that man is not all bad. God is confident that he can work with man. That man is not beyond recovery. God believes that given the right education, circumstance, and, education, uh, and opportunity, man will prevail over you. In spite of man's failure, God is optimistic. We have failed God many times, over and over again. Adam failed. Okay. And it came time that the whole world, whole world failed. And God was grieved to his heart. And he wanted to destroy mankind. God said that it grieved him to create mankind. Yet he is optimistic. In spite of all of these things, he is optimistic. He thinks that there is still hope for humanity. So he saved Noah and his family. So at every turn, God remained positive and optimistic that mankind will make it. 
out of his confidence came his ultimate plan. He sent his son to redeem the world. Okay. Why would God do that? Why would God sign his one and only begotten son for the world? Because God believes that humanity is worth saving and it can be saved. That is the optimism of God. God put everything on the line. He sent His one and only begotten Son for the world because He sincerely believes that there is hope. Not everything is lost. Everything can be gained. That is the positive disposition. That is the optimism of God. That is His faith in mankind. And that is His faith in you. And God believes that not only a few, but given the opportunity a lot of people will be saved. And He will be able to bring all of them into His kingdom. That is how optimistic our eternal Father is. He put everything on the line. His one and only God firmly believes without a doubt unbridled optimism that man given the opportunity given the chance with the right guidance of the Holy Spirit mankind will make it. When we look at the acts of God We cannot but come to the conclusion that our God is a super optimistic God. He sees the best in His creation. He sees the best in all of us. He believes that we have the potential to become a son and a daughter. He sees the best in you, in me, in the entire humanity. That's God. And when you come to think about it, that is over-optimistic. Super over-optimistic. You know, that you put everything on the line. The sun to save humanity. What kind of optimism is that? Is that a gamble? Maybe if you will be saved? Is that a gamble? That God, that God doesn't gamble. You know, God knows what He is doing. He is positive. He is optimistic. And He knows in His heart his optimism that many will make it. God sees the best in His creation. He firmly believes in the ultimate <clears throat> goodness of God. God believes that at the very end, <clears throat> righteousness will prevail. Goodness will triumph over evil. Mankind will choose God and reject Satan. God believes that righteousness will triumph over 
that humanity will be able to see, to see the light. The humanity will be able to see the goodness of God. Humanity will attain salvation. God is a hopeful optimist. He is super optimistic. How about you? Are you an optimist like God? What is your disposition in life? How do you see yourself in the world? Are you a pessimistic person that everything is dark and gloomy, sad, and doomed? Or you the optimistic, positive, happy person where everything is bright, happy, and good. So how is your disposition? Optimism in life allows us to do what is right. Not what is convenient, but what is right and we want to be right before God because we are a positive and an optimistic person because of our positive outlook we will always do the right thing and we will do good deeds that will bring good tidings. In our life, we should reflect God. Our God is an optimistic God. Sees the best in everything. And in our case, we should be like our God. We should be optimistic as well. Whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, whatever is of good report, we want to meditate on those things. Because these are the things that are positive. These are the things that are optimistic. We reflect the character of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Both our eternal Father, and Jesus Christ, they are all both optimistic. Jesus Christ came. He sacrificed himself for all of us because in his heart, he believes that is the right thing to do. That by his deeds, many will attain salvation. Optimism. Because God, has faith in humanity. God has faith in you. That we, you, me, together, entire humanity, will make it into the kingdom of God. And that is how optimistic both our eternal Father and our Lord Jesus Christ is. So, in life, we have to be optimistic because our eternal Father and our Lord, Savior, Jesus Christ is optimistic. So, at the very end, what should we be hopeful of? Where should we put our optimism? Our hope is in the resurrection. And our optimism is to be with our Lord Jesus Christ and with the Eternal Father. That is our positive outlook. That's our optimism. We're happy, we're joyous that one day we will be with Him. And similarly, 
God is optimistic too. He is optimistic that what He hoped for and what we hope for will happen. That day will be glorious. So with that, happy Sabbath to everyone. Stay optimistic. Bye.
thine own way. Search me and try me, Master, today. Whiter than snow, Lord, wash me just now. Happy Sabbath, brethren, and hoping that everyone is safe and in good health. Today, uh, we will discuss the part two, and we will finish the series about the book of James. Last time, the first part of the series, we have learned the following. Number one, James, the brother of Christ, was a non-believer and was not part of the original disciples of Christ. Number two, James later believed when he saw the resurrected Christ and became one of the pillars of the faith and he became an apostle to the Jews. And number three, James wrote a book and was considered the Proverbs of the New Testament and the theme of the book was about faith with deeds or works and how they work together for the benefit of Christians during their time and in our time today. We have read in the first part of the series the first two chapters of the book of James and we learn the following. In chapter 1, James emphasized that when faith is stretched coupled with trials and temptations, it doesn't and should not break. But instead, faith, as exemplified by our deeds, should produce authentic stability. It is during these trials, sufferings, and temptations that our faith will stand firm and become more stable. And the key takeaway for chapter 1 is this blessed is the one who perseveres under trial because having stood the test that person will receive the crown of life that the Lord has promised to those who love him so faith without works or with works produces authentic stability that will lead in receiving the crown of life while in chapter 2, James emphasized that when faith is pressed, it doesn't and should not fail. When dealing with partiality and prejudice, indifference, and mere intellectualism, instead, faith should produce authentic deeds of love, 
coupled with obedience and action. And the key takeaway in chapter 2 is this. Do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. So do what the word of God says, not just listen to it. Because in doing so, it produces an authentic love to others. And then we can say that our faith through works produce love. And love, as we know, is the fulfillment of the law. And that is also doing what the Word says. Today, we will finish the series and we will read the last remaining three chapters of the book of James. To start with, in chapter 3, in verses 1 to 12, this is talking about taming the tongue. James wrote, Not many of you should become teachers, my fellow believers, because you know that we who teach will be judged more strictly. We all stumble in many ways. Anyone who is never at fault in what they say is perfect, able to keep their whole body in check. But when we put bits into the mouths of the horses to make them obey us, we can turn the whole animal. Or taking the ships as an example, although they are so large and are driven by strong winds, they are steered by a very small rudder wherever the pilot wants to go. Likewise, he said, the tongue is a small part of the body, but it makes great boast. Consider what a great forest is set on fire by a small spark. The tongue also is a fire. A world of evil among the parts of the body. It corrupts the whole body. It sets the whole course of one's life on fire and is itself set on fire by hell. All kinds of animals, in verse 7, birds, reptiles, and sea creatures are being tamed and have been tamed by mankind. But no human being can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil, full of deadly poison. With the tongue, he said, we praise our Lord and God. And with it, we also curse human beings who have been made in God's likeness. Out of the same mouth come praise and cursing. My brothers and sisters, this should not be, he said. Can both fresh water and salt water flow from the same spring? My brothers and sisters, can a fig tree bear olives or grapevine bear figs? Neither can a salt spring produce fresh water. So here, James discussed the importance of taming the tongue which we use both for praising and cursing. He said that tongue is a fire and a world of evil among the parts of the body. It will corrupt the whole body. It will set the whole course of one's life on fire and is by itself set on fire by hell. King Solomon wrote about this in Proverbs chapter 12 in verses 18 to 19. And he said, The words coming out from the tongue of the reckless pierce like swords. But the tongue of the wise brings healing. Truthful lips endure forever, but a lying tongue lasts only a moment. What an encouraging Proverbs from King Solomon. While Apostle Paul reminded us that with our mouth, we profess our faith 
and also we are saved. In Romans chapter 10 in verses 9 to 13, it says, If you declare with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and you are justified. And it is with your mouth that you profess your faith and you are saved, he said. As scripture says, anyone who believes in him will never be put to shame. For there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek. And the same Lord is Lord of all and richly blesses all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be safe. And that's talking about praising God with our mouth and with our lips. To continue in chapter 3 of James, in verses 13 to 18, James here talking about the two kinds of wisdom. And he said, Who is wise and understanding among you? Let them show it by their good life, by deeds done in the humility that comes from wisdom. But if you harbor bitter envy and selfish ambition in your heart, he said, do not boast about it, or you deny the truth. Such wisdom, he said, does not come down from heaven, but is earthly, unspiritual, and demonic. For where you have envy and selfish ambition, there you find disorder and every evil practice. But the wisdom that comes from heaven is first of all pure, then peace-loving, considerate, submissive, full of mercy, and good fruit, impartial, and sincere. Peacemakers who sow in peace, they reap a harvest of righteousness. Here, James differentiated, differentiated the two kinds of wisdom. One is earthly, is unspiritual, and demonic wisdom, which leads to evil practice. And while the other one is the wisdom from above, as revealed by the Holy Spirit. It is through the indwelling of the Holy Spirit that we drew more wisdom from above. Paul further explained the working of these two kinds of wisdom as written in Galatians chapter 5 in verses 16 to 26. He said, So I say, walk by the Spirit. And that is the one revealing the wisdom from above. And you will not gratify the desires of the flesh, the other wisdom. The desires of the flesh is the other wisdom, the unspiritual, the demonic. And he said, for the flesh desires what is contrary to the spirit, and the spirit what is contrary to the flesh. They are in conflict with each other, so that you are not to do whatever you want. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. And the acts of the flesh are obvious, sexual immorality, impurity and debauchery, idolatry and witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, unselfish ambition, dissensions, factions, and envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. And that is the wisdom which is earthly and spiritual and demonic. And he said, I warn you, as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. He said, but the fruit of the Spirit, the Spirit who brings the wisdom from above, brings forth this fruit. What is that fruit? Love, joy, peace, 
gentleness, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such, against such things, he said, there is no law. And those who belong to Christ, Jesus, have crucified the flesh, have crucified the earthly, the unspiritual, the demonic, with its passions and desires. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking and envying each other. In the preceding verses that we have read, both Paul and James, okay, their writings, they jive together and even that of the writing of King Solomon. Now to continue in James chapter 4, in verses 1 to 12. It is talking about submitting ourselves to God. He said, what causes fights and quarrels among you? Don't they come from your desires that battle within you? He said, you desire but do not have. So you kill. You covet, but you cannot get what you want. So you quarrel and fight, he said. You do not have because you do not ask God. When you ask, you do not receive, because you ask with wrong motives, and that you may spend what you get on your pleasures. You, he said, adulterous people, don't you know that friendship with the world means enmity against God? Therefore, anyone who chooses to be a friend of the world becomes an enemy of God. Or do you think Scripture says, without reason, that he jealously longs for the Spirit he has caused to dwell in us? But he gives us more grace. That is why scripture says, God opposes the proud, but shows favor to the humble. He said then, submit yourselves then to God. Resist the devil, and the devil will flee from you. And he said, come near to God, and he will come near to you. Wash your hands, you sinners and purify your hearts, you double-minded. He said, grieve, mourn, and wail. Said, Change your laughter to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves before the Lord and the Lord will lift you up. And he said, brothers and sisters, do not slander, one another. Anyone who speaks against a brother or sister or judges them speaks against the law and judges it. When you judge the law, you are not keeping it, but you are sitting in judgment on it. But there is only one lawgiver and judge, the one who is able to save and destroy. But you, who are you? Who are we to judge your neighbor? Who are we to judge our neighbor? These are powerful words and admonitions from James. He talked about submitting ourselves to God and thereby resisting the devil. And he also said that we should not slander one another. And he said, who are we to judge other people? Apostle Peter wrote the same message in his first epistle in chapter 5 in verses 5 to 11. And let's read. He said, in the same way, he said, you who are younger, 
Submit yourselves to your elders. All of you clothe yourselves with humility toward one another. Because, he said, God opposes the proud but shows favor to the humble. It's the same message with James. And they both quoted it from Proverbs chapter 3 in verse 34. And then Peter continued in verse 6, Humble yourselves, therefore, under God's mighty hand, that He may lift you up in due time. Cast all your anxiety on Him because He cares for you. Submit yourselves to God. And He said, Be alert and of sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. And He said in verse 9, Resist him. Resist the devil, as also mentioned by James. And Peter said, Resist him. Resist the devil and submit to God. He said, standing firm in the faith. And that's what James is saying. That we, have, we should have that stability of our faith. He said, because you know that the family of the believers throughout the whole world is undergoing the same kind of suffering. And he said, And the God of all grace, who called you to his eternal glory in Christ, after you have suffered a little while, will himself restore you and make you strong, firm, and steadfast. And to him he said, Be the power forever and ever. Amen. So here, both James and Peter, they gave the same message. And again, they even quoted King Solomon's Proverbs. And what's that? God opposes the proud and show favor to the humble. So therefore, let's submit ourselves to God and resist the devil and the devil will flee from us. So to continue chapter 4 of James in verses 13 to 17, this is talking about boasting about tomorrow. Okay. He said, Now listen, you who say, Today or tomorrow we will go to this or that city, spend a year there, carry on business, and make money. Why? He said, you do not even know what will happen tomorrow, according to James. What is your life? He said. You are a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. He said, instead, you ought to say, if it is the Lord's will, we will live and do this or that. And as it is, he said, you boast in your arrogant schemes. And all such boasting is evil, he said. If anyone then knows the good they ought to do and doesn't do it, it is sin for them. Here, James pointed the importance of our life, relying on the will of our Lord, not our own will, and that God, Lord and God, and that we should continue not only by knowing, but also doing what is good to others. So now, before we proceed to chapter 5, in chapters 3 and 4 of the book of James, we learn that as emphasized by James, when faith is expressed, it does not and should not explode. Instead, through the deeds, it should yield authentic control and humility. What he's saying, it's not about boasting. It is about humbling ourselves. When our faith is expressed, okay? it is about controlling. Okay? Chapters 3 and 4 is about controlling. It's about controlling the tongue. 
taming the tongue. It's about controlling what our heart desires. And it's about controlling our will. But instead, submitting to God's will. And the key takeaways for these two chapters are, number one, God opposes the proud but shows favor to the humble. And the second one is submit yourselves to God and resist the devil. Now let's continue with the last chapter of the book of James. Chapter 5 in verses 1 to 6 is talking about a warning to the rich oppressors. He said, now listen, you rich people, talking to the rich people in the church. Because James' writing is primarily directed to the Jewish people, where he was the apostle. He said, you rich people, weep and wail because of the misery that is coming on you. He said, your wealth has rotted and moths have eaten your clothes. Your gold and silver are corroded, and their corrosion will testify against you and eat your flesh like fire. You have hoarded wealth in the last days. Look, he said, the wages you failed to pay the workers who mowed your fields are crying out against you. The cries of the harvesters have reached the ears of the Lord Almighty. He said, you have lived on earth in luxury and self-indulgence. You have fattened yourselves in the day of laughter. You have condemned and murdered the innocent one who was not opposing you. Here, James warned about the rich in the church who have become oppressors who exploited the poor workers. In Matthew chapter 6 and verses 19 to 21, Jesus advised us about storing treasures in heaven. And he said in verse 19, Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moths and vermin destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moths and vermin do not destroy, and where thieves do not break in and steal. He said, For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. So combining the two messages, both from James and our Lord Jesus Himself, they warned us, particularly the rich, oppressors that instead of exploiting the poor workers and hoarding their wealth, they should use it instead to help them and help others, which will result in storing treasures in heaven where there are no moths and vermin to destroy. Meaning, you will reef eventually you will reap eventually spiritual treasures a safe position in the kingdom and an inheritance from the lord so to continue in verses 7 to 12 of james chapter 5 it is talking about patience in suffering he said be patient then brothers and sisters until the Lord's coming. See how the farmer waits for the land to yield its valuable crop, patiently waiting for the autumn and spring rains. You too, he said, be patient and stand firm because the Lord's coming is near. He said, do not grumble against one another, brothers and sisters or you will be judged. The judge is standing at the door. Brothers and sisters, as an example of patience in the face of suffering, 
take the prophet who spoke in the name of the Lord. As you know, we count as blessed those who have persevered. You have heard of Job's perseverance and have seen what the Lord finally brought about. The Lord is full of compassion and mercy. He said. Above all, my brothers and sisters, do not swear, not by heaven or by earth or by anything else. All you need to say is a simple yes or a simple no. Otherwise, you will be condemned. Yes, as James wrote, that the Lord is full of compassion and mercy. Okay? Because God is so patient. It was actually the same description that Moses gave to the Lord. As written in Exodus chapter 34 in verses 4 to 7. Let's read. So Moses chiseled out two stone tablets, like the first ones, and went up to Mount Sinai early in the morning, as the Lord had commanded him. And he carried the two stone tablets, in his hands and then the Lord came down in the cloud and stood there with him and proclaimed his name the Lord and he passed in front of Moses proclaiming the Lord the Lord the compassionate and gracious God slow to anger abounding in love and faithfulness maintaining love to thousands and forgiving wickedness rebellion, and sin. Yet he does not leave the guilty unpunished. He punishes the children and their children for the sin of the parents to the third and the fourth generation. The Lord is full of compassion and grace. To continue in the last verses of chapter 5 of the book of James in verses 13 to 19 it is talking about the prayer of faith he said is anyone among you in trouble let them pray is anyone happy let them sing songs of praise is anyone among you sick let them call the elders of the church to pray over them and anoint them with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer offered in faith will make the sick person well and the Lord will raise them up. If they have sinned, they will be forgiven. Therefore, he said, Confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. And the prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. Elijah was a human being, even as we are. Prophet Elijah, one of the greatest prophets of God, he said, was a human being, he said. Even as we are, like Elijah, we are human beings. He said, he prayed earnestly that it would not rain. And it did not rain on the land for three and a half years. And again he prayed, and the heavens gave rain, and the earth produced its crops. And he said, my brothers and sisters, if any of you should wander from the truth and someone should bring that person back, remember this, whoever turns a sinner from the error of their way will save them from death and will cover over a multitude of sins. And so ends chapter 5. And James said that the prayer of the righteous 
is powerful and effective. Also, he said that whoever turns a sinner from the error of their way of life will save them from death and will cover a multitude of sins. On the other hand, Prophet Malachi wrote in chapter 3 and verse 16, similarly that the Lord always listened to the people who feared and honored Him. In Malachi chapter 3 in verse 16 written, Then those who feared the Lord talked with each other, and the Lord listened and heard. A scroll of remembrance was written in His presence concerning those who feared the Lord and honored His name. So what Malachi was saying, God always listened and always hear the messages, the prayers of those who fear Him and honor Him. And in the 22nd verse of the book of Jude, Jude, another brother of our Lord Jesus, he wrote, Be merciful to those who doubt. Save others by snatching them from the fire. To others, show mercy, mixed with fear, hating even the clothing stained by corrupted flesh. So he said, if we can save other people, snatching them from the fire, okay, by showing mercy, mixed with fear, by hating the stained cloth by corrupted flesh, we will be able to save more people. And it will cover over a multitude of sins. In this last chapter of the book of James, he explained that when faith is distressed, it does not and should not panic. When we are faced with money problems, with money matters, with sickness, with carnality and correction, our faith coupled with deeds should produce authentic patience in us. We need to be patient in all these sufferings. So there we have it as we finish the book of James in a two-part series. In summary, the book of James primarily written to the scattered early church members and believers and now carries a timely message for Christians today. All of us Christians, we are all facing difficulties of life, which may lead to all forms of our problems. Unbridled speech, wrong attitudes, doubt, strife, carnality, and even a shallow faith. He said that it is important to balance the right belief with the right behavior and that real faith produces authentic deeds. In chapter 1, as James emphasized, that when faith is stretched, it does not and should not break. Instead, with our deeds, it will produce authentic stability. In chapter 2, when faith is pressed, it does not and should not fail. Instead, with our deeds, it will produce authentic love. And in chapters 3 and 4, 
when faith is expressed, it does not and should not explode. Instead, with our deeds, it will produce authentic control and humility. And in chapter 5, when faith is distressed, it does not and should not panic. Instead, with our deeds, it will produce authentic patience. So meaning, when faith is stretched, it develops stability. When it is pressed, it develops love. When expressed, it should develop control and humility. And when distressed, it should develop patience. So how wonderful the workings of both faith and works. So there we have it, brethren, as we end the two-part series of the book of James. I hope that we have learned a lot in reading, comprehending, and getting the importance of the messages of this book that gives us a different take and pers perspective. Remember, as James emphasized, faith without works is dead. It is now up to us to apply the lessons written by Apostle James. Till next time, happy Sabbath to everyone.